Again, joining us now on the debate for the full hour tonight, in Arnhem, the Netherlands, via Skype, Mark Lewis, developmental neuroscientist at Radboud University in the Netherlands and author of Memoirs of an Addicted Brain, a neuroscientist examines his former life on drugs. In Minneapolis, Minnesota, Peg O'Connor, philosophy professor at Gustavus Adolphus College, where she teaches the philosophy of addiction. And here in studio, Vera Tarman, medical director for Renaissance, a residential treatment facility in Toronto, and Peter Selby, clinical director of the addictions program at CAMH, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. Also want to let you know our producers are hosting a live chat right now on our homepage. That's the agenda.tvo.org. And a representative from the Mental Health and Drug and Alcohol Helpline at Connects Ontario is also part of that chat. So chime in on the live chat or send us a tweet, hashtag the agenda, and please join the conversation. It's great to have everybody both uh, on the line in Points Beyond and you two here in the studio. Peter, nice to have you back on the program. Vera, first time for you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I want to start by just playing some tape. Uh, we, uh, every other Tuesday, are doing this Mental Health Matters series up until May. And our packaging producer, David Irwin, uh, has taken his camera and has interviewed several people suffering from mental health and addiction issues. And I want to play you a short snippet of tape here from a woman named Allie, who began abusing alcohol in her teens. Roll tape. I don't go around openly telling people that I'm an, I'm an addict and I'm an alcoholic even though I'm in recovery because they don't hear the recovering part. They just hear that I'm a drug addict and that I'm a bad person and I'm lazy and that I just don't have enough willpower. I think it's the same thing as telling a schizophrenic person to think their way out of schizophrenia. You know, like this is, um, this is a disease of the mind. Um, it's, it's also a physical allergy. It's just, it's the same thing as someone being allergic to peanuts. They break out in hives um, in anaphylactic shock. For me, I ingest alcohol and I break out and I want more. Mark Lewis, let me start with you because it, during the course of that interview, Ali mentions that people tell her, come on, you just need better self-control, get better control of yourself. So let's start there. Is addiction a disease you can control? Yeah, I don't see addiction exactly as a disease. I think it's a metaphor and it can be very useful. Um, but I see addiction as a developmental process, as something which um, accumulates or arises or becomes uh, self-perpetuating gradually over time. But once it, once it happens, as it becomes, as it becomes a, a uh, fully consolidated within the personality, it is very hard to control. And that's, that's you know, that's uh, something which needs to be understood. And I think that by looking at the brain processes underlying addiction as learning, we can begin to understand and treat addiction more compassionately and more, uh, more cleverly. Peg O'Connor, let me get you on that as well. Is addiction a disease that you can control? Well, I think I'm going to agree with Mark and say I think disease functions as a metaphor, but it's got some significant limitations. And if we do say it's a disease, I think I'd want to compare it to something like type 2 diabetes, something that develops over time, where the decisions and choices that individuals make can exacerbate that connection such that it becomes a, a full-blown disease. But it is something that involves choice on some levels and not on all levels. Well, that's where I want to pick up on, because, uh, Vera, some people would say, okay, it's either disease that you have no control over, or it's more likely learned behavior. Mm -hmm. Which do you think is more accurate? Well, I think one of the things that Mark was alluding to is that it's a, it's a learned behavior, um, and I would agree with that to a certain degree. Um, I, I, the whole question about whether it's a disease, um, if you think about it, you can just open that, that whole definition of what is a disease. I mean, depression we call a disease. It's, it's a neurochemical imbalance, and so is addiction. Addiction is as much of a disease as depression or as anxiety or as diabetes, so it, it really opens up the question of what is a disease. Um, and in terms of this, if there's any uh, uh, element of control, when you're working within the limitations, as, the, uh, as uh, Peg just mentioned, um, uh, within the limitations, you have a sense of control, but you also have limitations, and you need to acknowledge those limitations. And that's where the treatment fits in. Gotcha. Peter, where are you on this? I'm actually, I agree. I think we all come to this in many ways, like the blindfolded men who come upon an elephant and all touch different parts of it. Mm -hmm. We're all describing different parts of that elephant, and we need to get, put it all together. So what I do believe is that, yes, you can look at this as a developmental disease that starts in childhood. It's, it becomes manifest in, in adulthood in its most 
uh, uh, you know, explicit form, and its, its determinants are multiple. And so in, in essence, what it is, is that the very nature of what people then observe and say, well, this is a choice, and it's a learned behavior, is itself the, the deficit that is caused by that disease of addiction. Hmm. That it actually hijacks that very part that's supposed to fix itself, mm -hmm. that could take control, is diminished. So mm -hmm. in many ways, uh, everybody's right and everybody's wrong. Well, so let me pick up on that with, uh, with Mark, because there is you know, relative consensus on that first question among the four of you on the program tonight. And I want to know, Mark, how reflective you think that is of your profession in general. Yeah, there's, there's a fair bit of consensus, uh, but I, <laughs> what I find interesting is probably the two doctors on the panel still kind of are gra gravitate toward the disease metaphor, whereas the two non-doctors gravitate a bit away from it. Um, but Peter's right. Uh, diseases can be developmental, as in type 2 diabetes. Um, they, can, they, they can be acquired gradually. The trouble with the disease metaphor is that it implies that you, a disease is something you either have or you don't. And then you have a cure, and the cure either takes or it doesn't. And if you're cured, then the disease is gone. And if you're not cured, or if you have a relapse, then it's back. And uh, both as my experience, both from my experience as as an addict, and also from uh, studying the neuroscience of addiction for quite a few years, I just don't see that that is the best description of the process. Is that a good point, Vera? I mean, it's not. It's it is not a perfect analogy to a disease, is it? It's uh, more complicated than that. Uh, it's definitely more complicated than that, but I would, I would just argue then, it, when we're talking about mental illness in general, uh, that whole concept of disease becomes a metaphor because we, we, uh, it, it's, all, um, it, it's all very complicated. I can just I say hear you, that but you, I mean, you're calling it a metaphor, which means it's like, but not. No, I would, I would call it a, dis a disease in, in the way that we would call anything a disease. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and it, go ahead, Mark. Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> And I would, I would say that mental illness is also a metaphor. Yes. yes. So, so again, you know, yes. Vera mentioned that depression is also a disease. And I think most psychologists don't see it quite that way. They see it more functionally mm -hmm. as a problem or a disorder in the nervous system or the psychology of the individual, but not as a disease. A disease mm -hmm. is, a, is a way of classifying something. It has a certain number of characteristics, and then it can be defined as a disease. If it doesn't have those characteristics, then it can't. But as we know, with depression or other kinds of mental illness, mm -hmm. uh, there are so many variants. There's so many Wait, ways. Could I jump into that? Because mm -hmm. that's how you define mm -hmm. hypertension. Hypertension is, is a group of people got together and said, here's the cutoff. It's an mm -hmm. asymptomatic disease. There's no symptoms of high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. we got, people got together and said, OK, here's the cutoff, for which beyond this, it's hypertension, <laughs> which needs treatment. Because if you don't treat it, this person 5, 10, 15 years later is going to have a stroke. So mm -hmm. you're not diseased. You have no symptoms. That's why we call it the silent killer. Mm -hmm. Similarly with diabetes, it's a set cutoff point as to which you say, okay, that sugar is abnormal. So we've done that. It's a reductionist way of which science does all the time. Mm -hmm. Is there a set cutoff point for this? And so, yes, the mm -hmm. threshold-based kind of behaviors yes. that you say, if you meet these criteria, yes, you have the, the disease. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, you have use of the drug, and that's why drug use goes through the spectrum from use mm -hmm all the way to yes. dependence, mm -hmm. and, and it's, 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 it's a spectrum disorder, gotcha. as opposed to categorical disorder. Peg, in this country, when you Can want I to read something provocative, you read Margaret Wente, who's a writer for the Globe and Mail, and I want to read you a little quote of what <laughs> she wrote recently and then get you to comment on it. Uh, Margaret Wente in the Globe wrote the following. This is uh, back in May of 2011. The disease metaphor has been crucial and very welcome in the struggle to stigmatize mental illness. Now it also dominates enlightened public discussion of addiction. Redefining addiction as a disease and not a vice has powerful effects. It encourages compassion towards the sufferers, and that's a good thing. It also suggests that punishing or even criticizing them for their dependency is cruel and unjust. Does calling addiction a mental illness excuse the addict of responsibility, Peg? Yeah, I think what we encounter here is the classic kind of double bind, darned if you do and darned if you don't. If, if you say it is something of a disease, well then, oftentimes we think that people aren't responsible for it. Um, but it oftentimes depends upon what kind of disease we're talking about. If you encounter someone with lung cancer, just about the second question is, well, are you a smoker? And there's a presumed kind of blameworthiness there. So, you know, I think that 
however we think about these things, what are some ways to engender more compassion? Because no one actively chooses to become mentally ill or to be an addict of any sort. And I think a lot does ride on the categories to which we assign addiction. A mental illness or is a disease? I think the big fights are about the nomenclature. How do we call these phenomena? Mm -hmm. And for me as a philosopher, I tend to think of it as an existential condition not just a disease, not just a mental illness, but sort of right down into our physical and social, emotional and spiritual core. Vera, how does that sound to you? Oh, I think that that's a really excellent point, um, that, that, it, that at the, it's a disease right down to the emotional, spiritual core and existential condition. I think that's great because if nothing else, it will touch the hearts of all people, not just the ones who identify as addicts and alcoholics. Mm. Uh, this is something that affects everybody, but on a, on a spectrum, a level. And if I can just address the point about uh, where is our free will or our moral uh, uh, um, um, responsibility, uh, for the, even the person who is um, um, addicted uh, and in the throes of addiction, they still have the choice um, to pick up a drink or not, or pick up a drug or not. They don't have a choice about the craving and the phenomena that's happening, but they have a choice to do something about it. Just like the uh, uh, person who's got hypertension has a choice to take meds or not, or, right. the, or the diabetic. And we know, um, uh, the clinicians know that one of the biggest uh, truffles is getting the client or the, or the patient to uh, follow our instructions. Mark, can I, can I get you on that original question? Mark, calling an addiction a mental illness, does that somehow excuse the addict of responsibility in some way? Uh, in some way, not in all ways. Um, I, because I don't go for that definition, it, it's not that useful to me. Um, here's the thing. I think that if, if Peter talked about blood pressure, hypertension, hypertension and um, Indeed, your, your circulatory system is meant to function in a certain way. It's supposed to remain re relatively stable around certain parameters. Your brain is meant to function in a very different way. It's meant to change in structure through learning. That's the way the brain is supposed to function. Addiction has to do with changes in the brain that come about gradually and become more, more and more central and more and more powerful as time goes on. But it's not like blood pressure because it's not doing something it's not supposed to do. Rather, it is doing something it's supposed to do, but it's doing it in a very uh, non-adaptive way. Now, if we think about addiction in that way, as changes in brain structure, uh, then again, we should be uh, compassionate and understanding and we should remember one other thing, and that is the choice itself is not a simple thing. Choice is also mediated by the brain. Choice is very complex. And so, yes, addicts can make choices, but the way they make choices is very important for us to think about. Good point, eh, Peter? Yeah, well, actually, not really. Because, you don't think so? No, I don't think so. No? I think when, when you take a look at this, I think you go back to the existential issue. Mm -hmm. As a human being, we are all at risk of developing an infection. Mm -hmm. Some of us survive that infection depending on a whole bunch of factors, and some of us don't, and some of us need help. But it doesn't mean that we, we cluster ourselves away from, from the whole environment that causes that. We, we try to immunize ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it's sim similarly, our brains and our, and our feelings and the way our brain functions is essentially vulnerable to things that go on outside us as much as within us. So for example, you could actually, if you isolated people in certain societies, we see a much lower rate of addiction. Does that mean they're not prone to addiction? No, it just means that there are other factors outside of themselves that have done it. So when you say and you squarely put that level of choice into that individual, you could, there are people who could argue that that choice is equally uh, uh, a choice made by <coughs> commercial interests that push or market that drug, the policies and environment, the, the dealers, or whether it's the manufacturers of alcohol or tobacco or illicit drugs, whoever, who is pushing and preying on vulnerable individuals mm -hmm. for whatever reason to make them get, ad get addicted uh, is equally responsible. Well, let's do a hard and fast example here. Mark, you won't mind my asking mm -hmm. you a few personal questions here because after all, you wrote about them in your book. Mm -hmm. sure so uh, mm -hmm. let me ask you. you, you've been an addict. Do you know what initially led to your addiction? Yes, I do, more or less. Uh, it, had, it started with um, several years of being very depressed as a teenager. I was at a boarding school far from home. Um, I was just very unhappy there. I could not find like-minded individuals. I was trying to grow up and learn how to be a man, but in fact, I, I uh, 
I, you know, I found myself just lacking in any way of defining myself. It was a school that emphasized sports, and I wasn't a great athlete, and I was bullied to some degree. Other kids are too, um, but that was the beginning. And then uh, I left Massachusetts, that boarding school, and went to Berkeley, California in 1968. And you know what was going on in Berkeley in 1968? <laughs> sure do. <laughs> so, so for me, that was, that was, okay, I'm here, open up the pearly gates, I'm ready. Uh, and it was it was really that transition that that uh, was a, an opportunity for me to dive into the world of drugs and to start to explore different ways in which drugs could make me feel better. Do you want to be more specific about what drugs you were addicted to? Uh, I started off well in high school, like many others, with a little bit of booze and a little bit of pot, a little bit of cough medicine. Uh, once I got to Berkeley, it was wide open, uh, open season. I took LSD and other psychedelics, mescaline, psilocybin. Um, but those I wouldn't call addictions. A lot of other people, young people, were doing those drugs at that time, and it wasn't completely socially unacceptable. In fact, in my group, it was fairly acceptable. It was when I started doing heroin that uh, things began to take a downturn. Even my, my friends would not have been uh, very uh, um, accommodating about that kind of drug use. And indeed, I started to have two problems. First of all, I, I recognized that it was something I really liked. And second of all, it was something that I found very hard to give up, to not take. So those two problems combined I think that was the beginning of what I would call my addiction. And one more, did it never occur to you that you might be killing yourself in the process? Of course it occurred to me, yeah. But? Well, I, previously I mentioned the issue of choice. How do we make choices? Uh, sometimes we choose immediate rewards over long-term benefits or, or long-term aversive consequences. It depends on how impulsive you are, how much you're in the moment. Um, and the whole drug thing, the whole addiction thing, is all about that. It's about being in the moment and choosing what is there, what is tuning your brain to want to crave it right now at the expense of other rewards and other possibilities. So um, thinking rationally and thinking um, in a mature way about the consequences of my actions wasn't, it just wasn't happening. It wasn't happening. That was not a top priority for you. Okay, Peter, is it possible that addiction masks mental illnesses such as the anxiety or depression that Mark was just describing. Well, absolutely, but vice versa. Mm -hmm. Vice versa is also true. Is also mm -hmm. is true, right? So right. I in essence, if you take a look at our brain, it's, 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 still, you know, it's, it's evolving. We haven't yet reached uh, our full evolution. So, uh, you know, we, uh, and it's, it's the metacognitions that we have to sort of reflect on our behaviors. Essentially, there's a lot of guessing going on here. But what we do know is that they are associated. And we can see, and we can look at several ways of looking at it that the two go together more often than not. Hmm. Peg, how do you see that relationship? I think there's definitely a relationship. I mean, the amount of co occurrence of mental illnesses, depression, anxiety, alcoholism, any other kind of addiction, I mean, clearly these things go together. One of the things that struck me about what Mark said in thinking about addiction, I think one of the other ways to understand it is that our drug use, and I will out myself here as an alcoholic, our drug use is the axis around which other activities in our lives turn. It, mm -hmm. it comes to take on the, the central meaning, the central role in our lives. And when you're in the middle of it, you may well understand that you're really harming yourself or you're shooting yourself in the foot, you're foreclosing opportunities that on some accounting, these are the most important things to you. But you, you can't think clearly. It is a kind of irrationality, but it can also look incredibly rational to you at the time when you're in the middle of it. Uh, Peg, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but since you brought it up, you say you're an alcoholic. When's the last time you had a drink? That's correct. Uh, that would be August 1st, 1987. <laughs> August 1st, 87. So you have not had a drink in, Correct. let me do some math here, like 25 years. Just about, 24 Nearly and a half 25 years. 25 years, that's right. And you still Head call yourself... Class on your mathematics, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and you're still calling yourself an alcoholic, even though you haven't touched alcohol in a quarter century? I do, and, and I think that comes back to, for me, the ways in which certain kinds of labels can be identity conferring. That's part of who I am. And though I haven't had a drink, I might well say, I'm a, I also say I'm a grateful alcoholic or I'm a recovered alcoholic. But 
what stays steady there is the alcoholic part. I may well be able to take some drinks socially for a little while, but I really have no doubt that my use would pick back up pretty quickly. And for me, it's kind of a Pascal's wager. Am I willing to bet that I could handle it? And am I willing to lose everything that I have now? I'm not willing to do that. Hmm. Okay, let me read this out of Mark Lewis's book here. Here's, a, um, here's an excerpt on something we're calling desire. Natural goodies like food and sex certainly follow the progression from liking to wanting. Feels good? Want more. But with goodies, both natural and acquired, it is dopamine's flame of desire, unleashed by the ah of opioids that causes animals <laughs> to repeat behaviors that lead to satisfaction. Here, in one neat package, is the fundamental chemistry of learning which really means learning what feels good and how to get more of it. Yet there's a downside, the slippery slope, the repetition compulsion that constitutes addiction. In other words, addiction may be a form of learning gone bad. Uh, let's go around on this. Vera, at what point does addiction cross over from being just sort of a bad habit to mental illness? Well, oh boy, that's a hard question because that's, that's, a, that's, one, that's where, exactly where, um, it, it, it's as Peggy mentioned. It's when there's um, a point at which it's affecting. And the, our criteria of addiction is uh, it, it's very externalized. Uh, um, is it something that you can't put down um, when you want to do something else instead, and you you can't do that because you want to you're wanting to drink or use drugs? Um, if you have a, a cons negative consequences, um, if you try to stop and you can't stop. Uh, so in that spectrum, when you've reached that point, when you fulfill those criteria, that's when we call it an addiction. Um, I really like the, uh, Mark's piece there about that, that, that it, it is fundamentally an operant, an operant conditioned learned response. I mean, it, uh, essentially it is. And, and, and the biological piece might be that some people come to the table with, with uh, receptor sites that make us more easily to learn something more quickly than somebody else. But it is fundamentally a learned response. And I think that once you've learned that response, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, you can't undo it. In, in the same way as uh, we have a post-traumatic stress um, uh, a, a terrible thing that's happened to somebody, maybe, maybe they saw somebody um, fall off of a bridge or something, that memory is imprinted in their mind forever so that the next time they see a bridge, that's going to be there as a potential fear. And, and you could almost see that um, this positive, it's such an extreme positive reaction, it's almost like a post-traumatic stress of the positive variety, and that's going to be imprinted on the brain. And I, and I think that that's what makes a person um, an addict versus a non-addict. They don't have that, um, that powerful um, impact that will always... Um, be there. Mark, let me get your view on that. At what point does addiction cross over from bad habit to what would be described as mental illness? So Vera talks about it on the basis of external constraints and, and uh, uh, categories that are imposed by the society, by the culture, and that works, that's fine. I look at it uh, from a, a, a neuroscientific basis and what happens in addiction according to a number of theories is that the dopamine system. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter, a neuromodulator that, that gets us to attend to goals. And dopamine gets released by cues that are relevant to those goals. So when you see an apple, if you're hungry and if you like apples, you're going to start to get a dopamine rush. And if you see, you know, um, if you see an attractive person that you think would be interesting to be with, then you're going to get a dopamine rush. Now, the problem with addiction is that the very same thing, the drug or the drink or the gambling or the sex or whatever it is, or the, the, the shoe, if you're a, a foot fetishist, is releasing dopamine whenever you see it. But at the same time, you are arranging your inner landscape, you're arranging, not intentionally, you're arranging your synaptic architecture in such a way that thoughts and images and memories and reflections about that one thing take over many parts of the cortex. And as a result, you see those drug cues or those drink cues everywhere. You get a dopamine rush. The dopamine drives you. It is responsible for the feeling of craving. It cuts, it, it cuts you away from other goals and sends you chasing after that one goal. And it's that repetition compulsion, so to speak. It's that feedback loop that keeps you going after that one thing, further narrowing further narrowing your sense of what, what is meaningful in the world and further constraining where you're getting your dopamine. Dopamine is not about pleasure. Dopamine is about attraction. And it, it's the overwhelming attraction to a specific thing that blots out other goals that to me is the definition of addiction.
Peter, you sign on to that? Well, it's part of the story. Part Again, I said it's part of that elephant because mm -hmm. there are other neurotransmitters that are involved that have very little to do with dopamine. But no, you know, these transmitters actually, neurotransmitters work in isolation. So there is an issue of learning, absolutely. There's, but there's an issue of physical dependence. There's an issue of other <coughs> stress hormones and other hormonal variants that could come into play here. That, so learning is an important piece of it, but it's not the only piece of it. Uh, it is an important piece, but it's not the only piece that we see in people when they're, when they're either getting, developing their addiction or even when, uh, after the fact, uh, when they're recovering. Peg, let me ask you this. Do you think there's such a thing as an addictive personality? Mm. I w I want, I'd love to answer that, and I still want to weigh in on this learned behavior one. On the other one, okay. Go back to Aristotle. <laughs> on the other one, because I'm going to connect them, hopefully. Sure. So Aristotle talked about human nature, that there is something called human nature. But he talked about the ways that each of us develops a second nature, things, behaviors that become habits that become so ingrained in us, they're second nature. And a lot of these things are physical. I've played tennis for 36 years. I will bounce the ball three times before I serve every time. <laughs> I don't even notice that anymore. And when I think about addiction, I think about the ways that that's a kind of second nature for those of us who identify as such. And it's bodily. It isn't just in the brain. I can tell someone who's given up smoking by watching their hands. <laughs> or you can see people look at a drink in a certain way or how they hold their glass. So I would like to think about the ways in which <laughs> we don't just have addicted brains, we don't just have addicted personalities, but we have addicted persons. I am an addicted person. Might there be something going on with my dopamine? Absolutely. Well, hang on, let Is me jump there in there for a second. There, there's nothing, sure. there's nothing harm, I mean, you, Okay, you've got an addictive personality then, presumably, the way you're describing this, but there's nothing harmful about the way you bounce a tennis ball three times every time, right? So we've got to draw a line somewhere no. here. Well, yeah, we do, and I think it's right to draw the lines. I think my point was merely to demonstrate that there are some behaviors that become so ingrained we don't even notice them. They're unintentional. And at this point, to go back to the whole choice question, if a lot of using behavior is unintentional, in some sense, it isn't freely chosen in the way that we think about voluntary activity. So what does that do to this picture? I think it continues to complicate it. And do I have an addictive personality? I don't know. I mean, as a philosopher, I wonder about this thing called personality. Hmm. I see persons and not personalities. Okay, let me try it this way with you then, yeah. Peter. Is it the same thing, having an addictive personality, is that the same thing as having a genetic predisposition towards addiction? I think people have tried to do that because you want to say, well, at least you can measure personality, and so therefore that could be sort of a measure for somebody's genetic predisposition. And one of the things that, you know, after having looked at it, it's basically you come up with, look, addictions are equal opportunity diseases. They occur across classes, across personality types, et cetera. What is really important to understand is that it's, the explanation isn't whether it's genetic or whether it's environmental. It's interactional. It's what has happened developmentally, what's gone before. It's what's happening now, both at a macro, meso, micro level, as well as what's happening with you biologically and mm -hmm. psychologically. And that determines at that point in time whether somebody is manifesting an addiction or not. And so to, to separate it out of it would be like to saying, I'm only gonna look at somebody's eye and say, yeah, that's a human. Hmm. It, it would be, as, mm -hmm. so I, I, I don't think this is where, this is one of the problems with, with looking at something like addiction is that as soon as you get reductionist, you start losing, you, you start losing sight of what it actually is. And so I think you have to mm -hmm. have the gestalt and look at the pieces of the puzzle at the same time, as opposed to only saying, I've got the answer, here's the piece of that puzzle. Everybody wants that. But unfortunately, if you look at whether you come at it from philosophy or psychology or medicine or neuroscience, it's all of those together. And as soon as you take it apart, you lose it. Mark, do you think you've got an addictive personality? Yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> I think that Peter has talked about reductionism in two opposite ways. Before, he said that the disease model helped us to be reductionist, that science needs to do reductionism. And now he's saying that it's not such a good idea. Uh, both are true. Um, <laughs> okay, the, the thing about addiction, any addict or anyone who works with addicts will tell you that the fundamental psychological experience is craving. You take that away, you don't have addiction. Okay? Uh, if you put a starving rat next to a food supply 
and cut off its, its dopamine metabolism, it will not eat the food, it will die. You need dopamine in order, dopamine is the fuel of craving. So this is not just one of many neuromodulators. It is what, the, what neuroscientists call a common pathway to addiction. Now, going back to your question, uh, do I have an addictive personality? Yeah, I probably do. Um, that corresponds with being more impulsive, with, with novelty seeking, with um, maybe thrill seeking, which I, you know, I used to you know, be famous for as an adolescent and stuff like that, but there is no addiction gene. And so, no, I don't think, as, as Peter also says, we, we can't just look at the genetics, we have to look at an interaction of many different factors, both, both what you come with and what, what happens to you during the course of development. Vera? I just wanted to add that uh, in the, uh, with the American Society of Addiction Medicine, which is the general body um, of, uh, for uh, the study of addiction in the states, um, uh, they've, been, they've been grappling with this question also uh, for quite some time and came up with a new definition of addiction uh, earlier this year, which is an attempt to try to get the gestalt that uh, Peter's talking about, you know, saying that addiction is a uh, chronic physical um, uh, a progressive disease, uh, disease model um, that uh, incorporates the, uh, that gestalt of emotional, psychological, um, uh, physical, and spiritual as well. Um, and uh, so, so they come up with that as the essential base, and then they have the criteria, uh, some of which I was already alluding to before, uh, you know, the ABCDEs of addiction. You know, it, it, it's more than just cravings. It's is the, is the person able to abstain when they want to? That's the A. Um, are they able to control their, or their behaviorally control, that's the B, of their use? In other words, um, I'm just having one drink, um, and I can stop at one, whereas the alcoholic will say I just want one, but they'll, they'll want more. Mm -hmm. um, the cravings is C. Um, D, the diminishing of uh, consequences, um, like, uh, yes, uh, I, I know I got a DUI, but it was only one. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't <laughs> as bad as uh, somebody else's. Um, and then E, emotional response uh, to the uh, uh, substance itself. And if you fulfill those criteria, so, so they're trying to, uh, it, it, it's, it's something that we can't, uh, well, it looks like you want to say ahead. something. Yeah. No, I was just going to uh, speak uh -huh. to the craving. If you look at the research uh -huh. of cravings, it doesn't always precede a relapse. And so craving is a very fascinating thing. Do you crave things when it's freely available or only when there's a bit of the brakes applied? And there's a loss of the ability to, or the, or the desires are, are, are greater than what the brakes can hold. Do you have cravings then? And so it, it, in, if you look at some of the neuroscience experiments where they can even show recovering cocaine addicts uh, videos which are not even coming into the, into the realm of, of consciousness so quickly to the, you know, at, at a millisecond so that they, it's almost subliminal, you can see cocaine addicts in certain parts of their brains where there's this orientation towards addiction light up even before they experience any kind of craving. Mm. So, so what we are talking mm -hmm. about is that in, in essence, uh, cravings is one, absolutely it is something that we always, it, but it, it, it's still elusive and nailing it down and, and identifying it as always being the precursor to the relapse has been very difficult. People relapse for all sorts well, of reasons. Let me try this with Peg because mm -hmm. uh, you, you know you okay. were candid so, enough to tell us. Uh, stand by, Mark. I'm going to get to you in a second. Okay. Uh, you you were candid enough to admit to us that you are you consider yourself an alcoholic. You have not had a drink in a quarter century. Do you crave alcohol today? I I don't crave alcohol, but I mean here's an interesting story to get at the ways for me that it's this kind of physical second nature. So. I was throwing, someone had left a beer in my refrigerator and I decided to pour it out. I just didn't want it there. So I opened the, the bottle and it started to foam out. And what do you do when beer starts to foam out? You start to bring it up to your mouth. Second nature, didn't think about it. Did I crave it? No, but then suddenly there it was, the smell of it, the color of it, just made me think, wow, this still, still, this still has some kind of pull on me. I don't think about it. I don't you know, sit in my office craving, boy, do I want a beer. But I'm still aware of the ways in which I'm oriented around it and that it has certain kinds of meanings for me. And you worried that if, you'd, if you had a swig of that beer, you'd have had the whole beer, you'd have looked for a second beer, you might have gone to it. I mean, that's presumably what you were concerned about. It's possible. As I said, you know, I could maybe be fine with a couple of drinks, you know, for a good long while. But it seems that most people, when they relapse, at some point, a lot sooner than they expect, are just as bad off as when they stopped before. That seems to be the progressive nature of the disease. And as I've said, I just don't want to find out. I'd rather be safe than sorry. Mark, can I braise this with you right now? Speaking of the word relapse, 
You had one recently, didn't you? Not exactly. Okay, tell us what it was then. Uh, last year I was taking painkillers. I had a stenosis of the lower spine, the lumbar spine, and uh, I required surgery, so I was in a lot of pain for several months. And during that period, I was taking painkillers, opiate painkillers. And I certainly felt more than just pain relief. I also felt some uh, attraction and some uh, uh, psychological relief from the feeling of that drug. I probably always would feel that from that particular kind of drug. So the temptation was there, and there were, um, there were moments when I became fearful and I said, okay, I need to get off of this stuff. And I did get off of that stuff. Once I did enough yoga and enough physio, and once the surgery started to kick in, I was able to stop taking, taking the painkillers and that's what happened. It was nothing like the world that I lived in in my 20s when I was doing really nasty things to get drugs and when I couldn't turn off that, uh, uh, I couldn't turn off that compulsion. Understood, but, but if I'm reading between the lines properly, it was, it was of enough concern to you that you thought, boy, I just better not take any more chances with this stuff. Have I got that right? Yeah, I needed to, I needed to stop. I needed to say needed no to more. Stop. That, that's what I can do now. Uh, Vera and others have now raised this issue of self-control. Mm -hmm. uh, just for clarification, I, I didn't say craving was the only aspect of addiction, but rather it is a core feature of addiction. Mm -hmm. the, another core feature is the inability to control one's cravings. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't have cravings, you don't have to control them. The desire isn't there, then control isn't necessary. But if the desire is there, then you need to use a different part of your brain. You need to control the positive feedback cycle, whereby uh, craving leads to use, leads to craving, leads to use, and a, an ongoing self-perpetuating cycle. You need to use a different part of your brain, which is right up there, called the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. And yes, the, um, the phenomenon that I'm talking about is ego depletion. When you try to use mm -hmm. self-control online, when you try to withhold your impulses mm -hmm. for some period of time, ongoing 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, an hour, two hours, you give up. Something gives out. That mm -hmm. part of the brain becomes depleted of resources, and there's been dozens, hundreds of experiments that have re reliably replicated this effect. That's one of the things that's missing in addicts. And the reason why it's missing is because they need to spend too much of their time actively inhibiting their impulse. Mm -hmm. Very hard time turning their attention away from this thing because they desire it, because they desire it more than anything else. Peg, let me get your view on this. There, there's, of course, the kind of addiction that Mark talked about earlier, where he was addicted to drugs, heroin, and many other kinds as mm -hmm. well. Then there are other kinds of people who are addicted to an experience. Gambling, yes. uh, going to a casino, mm -hmm. betting on sports games, uh, sex. Is there a difference between those two different kinds of addictions? That's a wonderful question, and I've been thinking a lot about that, the substance versus behavior or, or process addictions. And if you say it has to do with the kind of dopamine responses you have in your brain, it seems like they're the same kind of responses, and it makes them the same thing. And I think if you look at the DSM-4 criteria, I think they are more similar than they are dissimilar. But where they're dissimilar, we need to attend to those carefully. But I, I would put them in the same umbrella, under the same umbrella. Can I say something? Vera. They're just as serious. Just as serious, yes. Vera, go ahead. Yeah, I'm really glad that you raised the issue of process addictions, because I have a, a real interest uh, in uh, food addiction. Um, uh, looking at either the way a person uh, uh, eats themselves, either overeating or the specific foods, like specifically sugar. Um, and uh, w w there's more and more research that's highlighting that uh, it, it goes to the same dopamine axis, uh, same reward center. Uh, so it, that, and, and that's one of the things that the Addi American Society of Addiction Medicine new definition of addiction is trying to do, is say, let's look away from the actual substance. We don't really care if it's alcohol, cocaine, or, or gambling, or, or sex, or internet addiction, or, or food. It's what it does to the brain. It does the same phenomena to the brain, and that's what we're interested in with addiction. If I can just say quickly, um, one of the things that Mark said uh, about self-control, um, 
uh, I, I absolutely agree that craving, there, we don't have a control over craving. If a person has a craving, there's no control there. And the only control the person has is in uh, picking up a drink, and that's very time limited. That's called willpower. It has a shelf life of very little time. I mean, uh, Mark illustrates that really well in his book, actually. Um, and that's where the whole topic of treatment comes in, is, and where does treatment fit in? Because treatment is to help that where the addict has no control. Um, to build in the supports that are necessary. Hmm. Peter, would yeah. you put food in that same category as cocaine or gambling or whatever? Actually, yes. There's, hmm. you know, when one way if you, you, if you step back as to what, is, what we are suffering from is actually a, you could look at it as a disorder of consumption hmm. and hmm. expenditure and, and mm -hmm. that mismatch. And we need both sort of top-down sort of ways to control it, but even bottom-up ways to... So you've got to get those desires less activated and you need to strengthen the, the brain, and in many ways, if you uh -huh. think about it, our brain is the only organ that outsources many of its functions. Uh -huh. And you know, whether we have paper or calendars or things like that, it's, we outsource so much of it. And the policies help us in making sure that our brains work right, and so that we have the ability to exercise control. Uh -huh. And so th that's always, and finding that right balance that doesn't affect our sense of autonomy, but yet, as, yet keeps us safe. That's our, that's our existential battle. Uh -huh. We want to be independent, but we also need these constraints. And so that's, that's the battle going on in our brains all the time. There are mm -hmm. desires that get balanced with, with, uh, with, with, with the controls. And it's much like, when it's beautiful, it's like a man riding an elephant. <laughs> when it's okay. wild, it's like an elephant on must. It throws <laughs> off its rider. <laughs> Understood. So. I want to talk about the Bible for a second, the mm -hmm. brain's Bible, the DSM. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, to you first on this. We know, I, I guess, next year, well, in the next year or so, the DSM-5, the next edition out, is going to come out and will include many new addictions in the pantheon of mental illnesses. I gather they're going to be adding sex addiction, ad addiction rather, shopping addiction, internet addiction. Does including these kinds of addictions devalue, in your view, the struggle with what you might, I guess, traditionally, more traditionally call the more serious uh, and traditional addictions? It's a good question. Um... In some ways, uh, I agree with, with, I think it was Peg um, or, or Vera or both, that these addictions are definitely addictions in the proper sense because they, um, they galvanize the whole dopaminergic system and they get that cycle going and desire becomes hard to handle. On the other hand, drugs have a very, and I include alcohol, which is, obviously is a drug, drugs have a very particular impact on the brain. They uh, are actually changing the um, systems of reward and relief and uh, neuromodulator flow directly. Whereas with shopping, for example, you are, your addiction is being mediated by real experience, by your interface with the real world. With drugs, that's not the case. You don't need a real world in between you and the thing you're addicted to. You just take it right into your brain and there you are. So there is something which is more powerful about drug alcohol addictions than some of these others. Peg, can I get your view on that, whether these new ones, sex, shopping, internet, belong on the list? Well, I think that they do because they not, it, it isn't just a matter of the same dopamine response, but it's what role do these behaviors play in someone's lives? Are they orienting most of what they do around them? And I think the answer is yes. But having said that, I worry about stretching the term addiction so far that it becomes too elastic and then it, it loses its power. Because what I hear now, people saying, oh, I'm addicted to this new show on um, this station or I'm addicted to this new salsa, that addiction in, in public discussions has become this kind of quirky thing to have and it loses its serious treatments and, and that I'm concerned about. But I do think at the end of the day that shopping, gambling, sex are addictions. How about hoarding, Peter? You want to put that on the list too? <laughs> I'm not so sure. But I mean, if you think about what DSM has done, it, it, it has actually taken common language words mm -hmm. like anxiety, like depression, and have had definitions or catch-alls for disorders within that. It doesn't mean that if you feel sad and you're depressed about something, you know, so the common language words have got mixed up. And so I, I think this, this occurs with the addiction, and I agree with, if you, with, with Peg, if you, if you actually dilute it, uh, the problem is you could land up with the Tower of Babel. 
uh, pr uh, phenomenon in speaking about the Bible. Mm -hmm. So what you don't want to do is perpetuate that and what the, the intent of a DSM-4 classification is so that we could have a common language when we are talking about it, not as a way to label somebody, but as a way to make sure we study it well. Fear, how about you on that? Well, I think that, I mean, just in favor of diluting, it will also destigmatize um, because the more people can identify with addiction, the more that they'll be compassionate because they see it in themselves. That would be a good thing. Um, that would yeah. be a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, the, but the other thing I want to say is let, let's not um, uh, minimize the uh, power of a gambling or food addiction. I mean, we, we just don't see it uh, in the same way. I mean, we see the addict, uh, you know, sweating and, and throwing up, and we see the, visual, the visuals of it. Uh, we may not see the uh, gambling uh, the person who's lost all their money uh, in one night, they've lost their whole, their whole life savings. Or the food mm -hmm. addict who what we see is the diabetic, overweight uh, person who dies uh, at 50 of, of a cardiac disease, which is actually a result of his food addiction. Well, we get all that, but shopping? Uh, well, shopping too, sure. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. it, it's a question of uh, the spectrum again, but we can see the extremes of that where a person can uh, go overboard with that too. Uh, well, at ChemH, uh, one of our psychiatrists has been following people who've been in recovery mm -hmm. and then looking at what are some of the other addictive behaviors that follow. And all these right. behaviors we're talking I, either come to the surface or have always been comorbid, but people haven't had that lens to look at it when mm -hmm. they're, they're so busy focusing mm -hmm. on the immediate. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only does the addict have the issue of uh, the focus on the immediate, we all have a focus on the immediate. That's the, that's the human issue. Our human nature is to focus on the immediate, mostly. And so similarly, this starts happening as we get people in, in helping them into recovery, we start seeing these other behaviors emerge. And so, mm -hmm. so you know, I think the story is still being told, and I think we're just beginning to understand our brains a bit better and understand what keeps it going and what is uh, uh, what the phenomenon that, that, that drive it. And once it's turned on, what I do know is that it's very difficult to turn off. Well, let's talk about that in our mm -hmm. remaining moments here. We've got a little less than 10 minutes to go, and we do want to talk about the road to recovery. Mm -hmm. And, Mark, maybe you could help us by starting us off here. Um, how did you eventually, uh, this is a simplif simplif simplified way of saying it, but how did you eventually kick those addictions that you were struggling with uh, 30, 40 years ago? Mm -hmm. Well, the focus on the immediate is very much the issue, as Peter said. And... Uh, uh, for me, uh, well, okay, just, just to answer your question directly, for me, um, the, the things that I was doing to acquire drugs and the drugs that I was taking and the, the feelings that I got from them became so aversive, so, uh, so repulsive after a while that the attraction to drugs was, was counterbalanced by, by uh, a repulsion, a feeling of repulsion. So the attraction was itself diminished. So you didn't but need a program, so to speak. I tried various things. I mean, most addicts will have tried to kick many, many times. That's just fundamental. That's part of the problem. Uh, if you've tried to kick, kick your shopping addiction many, many times and failed, then maybe that would classify. I don't know. But uh, for me and for, for other drug addicts, uh, you try and you try and you fail. I, I finally succeeded when I was able well, first of all, when I hit bottom, as they say, you hit bottom and that's when you start to go up because you just, you, you can't stand that life anymore. It's just too awful. And secondly, for me, I started to talk to myself in a different way. I started to say to myself that I can say no. I can say no minute after minute, hour after hour, day after day, week after week. And I started to believe that that was possible, that I really could do that. It was that kind of inner voice and that kind of reorganization of my intention, of my intention, of my, my will, my, my sense of making choices that helped me get through that difficult period. And then as the weeks went by, I saw that it was working. Hmm. It was working. I could do it. Peg, let me follow up with you. The so-called 12-step program is thought to be the gold standard of kicking it. Uh, do you believe it's the gold standard? I think it's the gold standard for many people. I think that it's been one of the most powerfully effective treatment programs out there. So the people for whom it works, it, it works really well. I think what I come to realize, I've come to realize though, is that there are many ways that we develop into addicts. There need to be as many or more ways for us to be in recovery. The 12-step model is incredibly important. There are other models and approaches out there that I think whatever works for someone, then they should go for it. And I think that our needs change over time as we develop. So why wouldn't what we need to, 
to be in recovery or to have good sobriety, why wouldn't they change and evolve as well? And that's a very good thing. Vera, where are you on the issue of whether you can do it on your own or whether you need some kind of intervention or help from others? Well, I think that's a great question to ask. Thank you. Um, I, oh, first of all, I mean, I work at Renaissance and we're very 12-step focused. So, uh, and, and it, it, it answers uh, di directly to your question. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, if I can say though pr uh, preliminarily, um, when I, I've seen many, many people who are, you know, sitting on my examining table with full-scale cirrhosis or like, like end-stage cirrhosis, um, I, I mean, they, their, their belly is so far out. I mean, it, the, the, their lifespan is not very much left uh, and they'll still continue to drink. And I wonder where is their bottom? It just isn't there. Um, and, and I think that what the key is is that they have to be willing to uh, not so much acknowledge that their pain is so bad, but that they're willing to ask for help because uh, can you do this on your own? I don't think so. I think if a person has reached that stage of addiction, um, uh, uh, the, the rare person might be able to say, I'm just going to learn how to say no on my own and stop. But um, I don't think that for the most case, most cases, I think that people need help. And that's where the 12-step program comes in, or some kind of program where you can uh, essentially have somebody act as uh, your thinking part of you when it's not available to you. Um, Peter, how about pharmacological yeah. options? Well, I think it's, it is one part of the option. There's no magic bullet. It has to be contextualized. But again, I think it is it's coming to meeting people where they're at where the, rather than where we think they should be. And so that's, what we, that's the approach we try to take at CAMH and, mm -hmm. and try to make sure that uh, we meet people at that level because not everybody is ready to stop. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the issues with programming. Uh, you know, do you only get people when they're ready to stop, in which case that's only a small proportion of people who actively have the problem? And, and do we need to make sure, and we have programs to deal with the people who are accruing harm and risk mm -hmm. so that we can actually have that compassion that you're talking about. Here's Ian Brown writing in the Globe and Mail last fall. But a cure for addiction may be impossible. If Mark Lewis is right and addictive tendencies are as universal as he suggests, there is no such thing as an addict. There are only more and less extreme cases of neurological longing. Mm -hmm. Desire, the foundation of human choice, as rationalism would have it, and therefore of human dignity, is actually most of what we are as human beings. Market suggests there's actually kind of a fine line between addicts and the rest of us. Is that true? Yes, I think that is true, yes. The longer you live, the more you think that. Uh, I, you do see it all around. You see it in yourself. You see it in your friends. You see it in others. Um, it is a spectrum, as has been said. Um, I, I started a blog at the time that the book came out in Canada, uh, memoirsofanaddictedbrain.com, and I'm learning a lot about addiction through the blog. A lot of people are writing in and um, talking about their addictions to a great variety of things. And with respect to what Vera was saying recently, there are so many ways of recovering. People recover in so many different ways. I don't think there's one way. I think there's a variety of ways, and that reflects the variety of... of personalities of, of human strengths and weaknesses, the variety that, you know, that characterizes who we are as people. So, well, um, If I so may say, you've all been extremely helpful today, and beyond that, I also want to say, please go to our webpage if you're looking for some help in this area, theagenda.tvo.org. We've got links there which will take you to other websites uh, to give you help, information, whatever it is that you may need on this subject. Thanks so much to Mark Lewis on the line via Skype in Arnhem, the Netherlands from Radboud University, his latest, Memoirs of an Addicted Brain. Peg O'Connor was on the line from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Peg, thanks so much for being there for us from Gustavus Adolphus College. And here in our studios in Toronto, Thank you. Vera Tarman, the medical director at Renaissance, and Peter Selby from CAMH, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank Wonderful you. discussion tonight. Thanks. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.